in our final audition for the show, we had to read with Dan in person. Uh, we had to do a chemistry read where you read with the other actor. And it was in this glass office in Beverly Hills where all the walls were glass. And so I was walking from the waiting room to the room and through the glass, I could see him <laughs> the other side. And I have never been that nervous. Miracle Workers, Deadpool, and now Seven Days. Actor and writer Karin Sony is killing it, and we are about to hear a roller coaster ride of stories about how he made it in Hollywood. This is part two, where he talks about meeting his childhood idol, Daniel Radcliffe, hanging out with Steve Buscemi, making Miracle Workers, and writing and starring in a film that just won the Independent Spirit Award for Best Feature Film, Seven Days. All right, I have to ask you about Miracle Workers, though, before yes. we wrap up. Yes, yes, yes. You know, because I, I told you, I love it, and you're oh, so you. good in it. And I feel oh, like I didn't even hear of it until like a year ago. And I'm wondering, I know. <laughs> how do we get more people to see, well, understand that there's a show out there that is just pure joy? I know. We were talking so much about Hollywood, and I think that's sort of the thing, too. There's more shows now than ever. And there's so many big people. And you would think it back in the day, if you told me Daniel Radcliffe was on a TV show, everyone would know what that was. But it's just the reality of where we're at. But what's exciting is, and we're lucky, is that the show's gone on. We're doing our last season, the fourth season this summer, is every year, every month, more people will find it. Yeah. <laughs> you reach out to me and be like, oh my God, I just watched three seasons of it. I think one thing that bums people is that, and what is so fun about it is that we're completely different every year. So people get confused with like what show is what. And they were like, wait, you're in heaven and then you're a cowboy. And like, what's happening? And like, how is this going to be explained? But that's part of like the pure joy of it. But yeah, I, I would say it's all available to watch on HBO Max, um, the previous three seasons. And then it airs normally on TBS and then moves to HBO Max a few months later. So normally when it's on HBO Max, like a lot of people couldn't find it. But yeah, it's out there. Um, it's so. out there. I've been telling people about it and I'm oh, still now, this you. gives me another chance to tell more people about it because I always yeah. rave about it too. And yeah. you're right. Like, how did I, when I first heard of it, I was like, how is Daniel Radcliffe I and know. Steve Buscemi in a show? I and I didn't even know. And I'm, this is my I field. Know. So I, I was like, know. what? It's so crazy. But the discovery was so good because I actually had, I did have, have Dan and Steve on the yeah. show. And yeah, so I watched it in leading up to it. And I was like, yeah. this is so I watched season one in time. Mm -hmm. I think I might have started season two by the time I talked to them. Sure. I was like, this is too good to be true. <laughs> I, it was so funny. I saw you also because I told you I was I was checking out your Instagram. Yeah. And I was I'm scrolling back and you were somewhere at some kind of event. It was must have been a Harry Potter thing. Uh -huh. And you were like, you said something like, okay, I hope Dan doesn't see this. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I went to Wizarding World at Universal when it oh. opened and I bought a wand. I spent a hundred dollars to buy Hermione's wand, which is I've never used again. It's a piece of plastic that's modeled to look like the wand that Emma Watson had in Harry Potter. And it was there was another wand next to it that was like 20 bucks. And I was like, I want Hermione's wand. I was like, it's a hundred dollars and still in the packaging. Um, but yeah, I'm a huge, huge Harry Potter fan from the books first. And uh, what they were coming out so me and Dan are very similar I think he's like six months younger than me so when they were casting and they were talking about those books like I was the age of Harry like I was 11 or 10 years old when I remember reading that they were like casting it and I used to wear like the the round glasses um, as a kid and so I truly thought because of those two reasons that I was the age of the character and I had round glasses forget that I was brown and had an Indian accent I lived in India and I didn't even audition for it I thought that someone would be like you should be <laughs> and then I remember reading like they had cast them and I was so mad for like a few days and I couldn't process my feelings and people were like why are you being so passive aggressive I'm like I'm not in Harry Potter so like what the hell and then I used to have like these weird elaborate dreams where I'm like maybe because the books were still being written and coming out and I would read the new book and I'd be like is there an Indian character like <laughs> like and then there would be like none and I'd be like oh damn it <laughs> there isn't any but I have like posters of Dan from like the movies in my childhood bedroom like I was a huge fan and then when, the, you know, there's now like, I had been in Hollywood for like eight, nine years when I auditioned for that, or maybe a little bit less. And I had sort of got, gotten over like some of the starstruckness of things because it just becomes more normalized. And then I distinctly remember seeing the email that he was gonna be in the show. And I was like, oh my God, like all those feelings like came back. And I was like a 10 year old kid again. And our final audition for the show, we had to read with Dan in person. Uh, we had to do a chemistry read where you read with the other actor and it was in this glass office in Beverly Hills where all the walls were glass and so I was walking from the waiting room 
to the room and through the glass, I could see him <laughs> on the other side. And I have never been that nervous. And it was like all those sort of feelings came back. So it's so crazy now to think like that we're friends and we text about The Bachelor and all these other things. But like, it is very, very bizarre. And then when we did the first season, the movies had just come out on HBO Go or whatever. And um, so I would watch them. I would watch a movie every Sunday. And then on Monday, I would like ask him about it. <laughs> Yeah, and like ask like because now I was asking beyond like, I was like how did you film Quidditch because now I was like I have other questions about filming and stuff too and he was so generous and gracious with all <laughs> and patient with all my fandom but I really exhausted it the first season and now I don't really bring it up anymore but um it is very exciting uh, that and is he's the nicest person yeah he seems like the nicest person I didn't talk to him that long mm -hmm. but he does seem like totally genuine and authentic like you're describing him yeah. as somebody who can handle all of that like Yes, we've talked about it a little bit and he's described it to me as like, he acknowledges that like his face will forever be the memory for so many people's childhood and not even childhood, like adulthood too. And that he doesn't have to do anything and it brings people joy. And instead of fighting it, he's embraced it and he's always open to talking about it because he knows it's bigger than him. Like, it's just, I don't know, like it's just, and it's very interesting when we were filming the first season we filmed in Atlanta, I've, you know, it's like wild going on in public with him because it's like next level, like people really lose their mind, they start crying, like it's very intense even now. But this recurring thing would happen where older women would start just bawling when they would see him and then he would hug them without even like them saying anything. And I kept being like, that's a strange interaction because different people have different interactions. And he was like, there's a whole sect of people, mainly women, who were older and were in abusive relationships and related to Harry because he was locked under a, a staircase and not treated well by his family and then became the hero still. And it's so interesting, the fandom, because I heard it as a kid and I was like, I want to go to Hogwarts and I want to be in Hufflepuff or whatever. And that was like my memory, but there's the books and that's just like uh, really about the writing and how powerful it is have touched people in all shapes and forms and different things that you don't realize but he gets to experience every spectrum of it and it's huge and it's crazy and he's i think doing the right thing which is he just embraces it and he embraces that it is an important part of people's lives and like if you just give a little bit of yourself like people will be remember that forever like they'll yeah. remember that he was nice um and so yeah but it has to be exhausting too and there's only so much he can do too so i think it's like a balance always of like what to do but he's yeah. the nicest person yeah. that's so interesting though too that like i wonder how he even discovered that about know, that just, like subgroup of fans yeah or... well i think it just kept happening so often and then people would tell them hit their story and uh -huh. why like you know when they saw like when they read it like they loved that he was the hero and he was essentially abused by his family and then he still ended up persevering and they were like it, it got me to leave a relationship a bad marriage like different things like reading the book that's amazing actually that's yeah, really cool so see people get inspiration from so many different places so um okay a couple of things i want to make sure that yes. i that i got okay so miracle workers four season four where are you filming that we're gonna film in la um so we start in may i believe so. Can you tell me anything about what the premise uh, is? Well, I know the premise and I don't think I can say it, but it's very good. Okay. It's very good. I can't say it. I believe you. I can't say anything, but it's very, it's very good. Very different from um, the other ones again. And um, yeah, I'm excited for whenever they always make a big deal of releasing the photos of what we look like the first mm -hmm. time. And that's part of when they reveal what it is too. And I've seen some photos of what I will look like and it's very fun. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. So um, Steve Buscemi, what about him? Yes. Oh my gosh, the sweetest, best man, a truly like a gem of a human and like so kind. And Steve is like weirdly the youngest at heart from all of us because we're all like in our like 20s and 30s, but we filmed the second season in Prague, which was an amazing experience. It was right before COVID in 2019. And Prague is like a party country. <laughs> you know this? Like, it's like people love to party in Prague. And so there's like raves and different things. And we would all be like in bed by 10 p.m. And Steve was like, I'm going out. <laughs> he would be like out and he made like all these young friends. And like, he was like having the time of his life and we're like, he knows how to live. It's kind of amazing. 
That's um, so interesting. Yeah. He's, well, he's, he's talk about a New Yorker. Like he's like a quintessential. New oh my Yorker. God. I mean, I didn't know the story, but and maybe a lot of people don't, but when we first got cast, like someone told me the story of like what embodies like who Steve is as a person. And when 9-11 happened, he took a year off of acting yeah. and became a volunteer firefighter. Yeah. And to clean up the, the rubble. And that to me is like, that is Steve. Like he just is like, all this yeah he's not phased by any of the like shiny stuff in hollywood like he does it because he loves it but he's it's not the be all and all of his life like he has a complete and full life and i think that's so wonderful that's so cool okay i just have to tell you also i have to give you feedback you're such a good storyteller like not oh, just for you. the movie but just right thank now you. as we're talking you're yeah so well good that's at that's like why i began writing to be honest because i you know i was and this is common that happens with people is like you first are attracted to the shiny thing which is acting because it's just the thing that's the most exposed like I couldn't even tell you what an editor did when I used to watch movies in India like an editor what like <laughs> such little like understanding of it and then so a lot of people get into acting first but then quickly discover that there's other aspects of it that they really like and, and are good at and I think it's one of the saddest things that I've witnessed is when you can't let one dream go away and you're so stuck on trying to make it work and you can't pivot to something else that you could thrive in and be good at because you refuse to let go of like, I, but I came here for this one thing. Uh -huh. But so for me, I struggled with that a little bit too, where many people would be like, you're such a good storyteller, you should write. And I was like, no, like I'm committed to this one thing and I'm doing well, I'm going to do it. And then it was eventually uh, so many people saying it that that got me to begin writing. And I'm glad I did because now we're talking about a movie that I helped write. First, I have to just rave about the movie a little bit because oh it was so, as I said, I really didn't have any expectations. I wasn't really sure what to expect. I don't even think I read the summary of it, like the synopsis yeah, before I watched it. It's the best way to watch anything. It's so rare nowadays, but it's the best yeah, way. Yeah, it was the best. And um, so I just watched, started watching it. And I'm like, this is so, this is so funny from the get go. Like just the beginning scene it was hilarious. Like when you guys were picnicking yeah. and then I'm laughing and it's like sweet. And there's so many things to it that I just love. It's everything. And you just feel good watching mm. it. And after watching it, I don't want to give anything else away except yeah. for the fact that, I mean, we want everybody to know, I guess, that it stars the two of you. You yeah. filmed it right at the beginning of the pandemic, right? Yeah, about, I would say, end August, early September. So a few, like a few months into the pandemic. Yeah, but okay. I think for all of us, the first set we had been on, including the crew, since we had stopped uh, filming everything. So March, I think everyone obviously stopped working. And then over the summer, the unions were working out, like, what is it to be on a set again? Like, what kind of testing, all that stuff. So for all of us, it was our first sort of time doing this job again with new yeah. circumstances. Well, yeah. you seem very natural. It seemed like it was just <laughs> like you didn't see it. You just seemed so real. And it was really just the two of you, right? The whole yeah. time, except some you would get some characters coming in here and there. Yeah. So the story is that you play somebody who I'm going to try to try to describe it so i can help to... you out too because i've done so much press but i'm more than happy you let me know if you want i know to i just feel bad because i know how these press days are and it's like you have to say the same things over I and know. over eight it's a version times. of acting huh yeah i guess i always feel bad for you guys and i've you know i this is what i do i i talk to actors mainly and so i yeah. get it i know i've heard all about what it's like <laughs> and I know lots of times i've been like, people, like oh but you want to join the press day and interview somebody yeah. and i'm like no no, 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 thanks. <laughs> I, they don't like it. I don't yeah. like it. I need to sit down and have an actual conversation with somebody. So I yeah. give you credit for getting through those days. But so this is why I'm trying to let you off the hook. So I will try okay, to describe it. Please do it. it. Yes, I love it. But I probably won't do it as well. So because I don't have a, like a, uh, a script for it. So, sure. okay. So I'm going to say it's about you play a, um, a character who is hoping to get married soon, is looking for an arranged marriage. Mm -hmm. Very He's very close to his mother and <laughs> they're working it through together. So you meet all these women and find the one and hopefully you'll be married in seven days, just like your own parents were. Is that okay? Yes, that's pretty true. Yeah, he- That's the beginning. Looking, yes, he's looking for, yeah, he basically is looking for basically another traditional Indian person. So someone who like is like him, doesn't eat meat, doesn't drink, sort of maybe has like a more of a, more traditional Indian background. So he goes on these Indian matchmaking websites, which are real and exist to find sort of similar women. And then he ends up meeting this girl who on her profile is described like everything he would want. <laughs> and then he very quickly realizes that that is not the case. Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> so the two of you, the two <laughs> characters play off each other in such an interesting way. The dynamic is just so, yes, like I could see you both seem so real. Like these are real people. Mm -hmm. We're watching real people here. Right. And so you're, it's funny, but it's real. So, yeah. <laughs> and you co-wrote it, right? You co-wrote it. I did, it. yeah. This is the first, I've written like a few things before, but nothing has gotten made, which is a very kind of common thing in Hollywood that you don't realize until you get in is that um, so many scripts never get made. So I, I, I began writing my first script in 2016 and then just trying with different things to get it made. And then my partner um, who co-wrote it with me, but is also my life partner, Roshan Sethi, who co-wrote the movie and directed it, um, has been a successful writer for about a decade um, and cre co-created the show The Resident on Fox and has had like a few things made. Uh, but even he was in the same boat. So when we 2020 March happened, a bunch of projects that he had written were suddenly not getting made because no one was making anything and he was sort of feeling low. I was supposed to act in a few things that all kind of went away because nothing was getting made. And so we were just in this very sort of like creatively dark place where we were just looking at the rest of the year and thinking, how are we gonna satiate ourselves creatively and like find purpose in the day every day, which I think maybe a lot of people were in different ways. And for me personally, there was so much talk in those early days about social distancing and all that stuff. And I just remember thinking like, no film set can work socially distanced. Like it is a group of people coming together sometimes in tight quarters to make stuff. And I was like, I don't know how my job can exist in this new world or whatever. And this is before they had worked out the testing and how a set would function nowadays, but it all felt very ominous. And so Roshan sort of had the idea to be like, why don't we just write something together and we had done one script before that again didn't get made and so we had had the experience of writing together before and enjoyed it and so we were like why don't we write something together and then we'll just maybe film it literally with our phones like we're just looking to go back to like the childish version of ourselves who just wanted to create and just feel like some excitement of doing that job that we miss so much and so that's sort of how it began was him sort of suggesting that and then we began writing the script and um, his family, so he comes from quite a traditional Indian family. Um, and he was on, before he came out of the closet, was on these Indian matchmaking websites and had been on dates with several women. Um, and this was loosely inspired by what would happen on these dates, which was, you know, a lot of these websites people don't realize is the parents make your profile. Um, so in the movie, it opens with the mother's narrating. Their profile. Um, and because often it's important that their parents approve of each other's quote unquote family values before they set up the kids together. This is a very Indian thing. And so normally in India, like I come from arranged marriage, but I grew up in India and, and the way it works there and it's still very common is it's just a social thing. So like, you know, my mom will be like, oh, I met my friend at the grocery store and her daughter just turned this age. And then your friend is this age. So maybe we'll just set them up and let them have coffee and see how they feel. And so it's like very casual and sort of like weirdly like your parents are setting you up on a blind date. Um, but here in North America, I learned through Russian because he grew up in Canada, um, that the Indian community is so spread out. So if you are from a more traditional background and you're looking for someone who's the same sort of religion and ethnicity, um, it's often these websites that connect people from across like North America to meet and often your profiles are made by your parents. <laughs> and, um, so he would go on these dates and his mother would describe this perfect woman that he, she had communicated with through with her mother. Um, and often, you know, he would sit down and like the first thing the girl would do would order a bottle of wine and be like, I have a white boyfriend, so I'm just getting this over with. <laughs> like, this is never gonna work. And so it just always was so funny. And it was really revealing to us of like the disconnect between like what our parents think we're up to <laughs> and what we are up to. And like the, the whole mix of like Indian culture that comes into it, like what's considered traditional, what's considered modern, like what are some of these archaic things that we're still expected to behave as, as men and women and stuff. So we always wanted to do something in that world. Just this idea of like, your dating profile being managed by your mother just felt so funny to us. And we were like, that has to be a movie or something. And then COVID happened and we were thinking of ideas of like what to make and write. And very quickly we realized if we wanted to make something safely, it would be as few actors and crew as possible. So it became like, okay, it would have to be like one or two people in a location. And then we were like, what could be an interesting story? And then one day I was like, wait, what if it's this, you know, they meet through this website and then it's this thing of like, it's not who they, each person said they were and then they're forced to like 
sit with that for like a few days versus like the date ending and you never speaking to this person again. And that sort of became the genesis of the whole thing. And then once we had that, we wrote it very quickly. Um, it just sort of bored out of us. Well, that makes sense. Why it seems so real too is because he was through a lot of it. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, some of this movie opens with the dating profiles and some of it is straight up stolen from dating profiles we read uh, the way, um, like one of them I think was like a mother being like, my daughter's favorite hobbies are taking care of her in-laws. And I'm like, that's no one's <laughs> hobby. Like, you're so thirsty lady. You're trying so hard to sell your daughter. Like, it's just like, like whose hobbies to take care of their in-laws, but it's such an Indian thing. But that is so funny. And then also like, what about the, there was just some funny little things too that like had me cracking up, which were the t-shirts that you would- Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. So this is, uh, these were little things when we were imagining like being in one location and practically what it would be. My character is not really, he's packed for a day trip. So he doesn't really have clothes and stuff for like a longer stay. And um, so one of the ideas and where we had was that we're like, well, wouldn't it be funny if he's wearing some of her shirts? And I have one of my best friends, Deborah Baker Jr. She um, is one of those people who just has every kind of fun shirt and every day she has a different one and they're all like so good. And I was like, oh my gosh, like what if I wear her clothes? And so um, we just didn't know which ones we were gonna pick but in the script, we just wrote that I'm wearing her clothes and that they're just these funny, clearly for women t-shirts. <laughs> Um, and then one day I just went over to her place before we started shooting like from six feet apart and she did like a little fashion show for me where she just pulled up different shirts on hangers and I was like yes queso queen like yes radical body love yes <laughs> all yes. these shirts and then um, at one point she was really trying to convince me to wear a crop top and I was like I don't think I'm ready for that yet but <laughs> we have discussed at a certain point um but yeah that that's become like a favorite of a lot of people uh, yeah and now, good picks yeah you a lot of people well. asking about these shirts and yeah that is so funny all right you're breaking up just slightly oh, no. like i don't oh, know no, if it's no, no. me or you so let me just, i'm just gonna try another airpod and see if it's okay me. great so just talk again if you don't mind just for just um, like testing a testing talking speaking now can you hear me i is do it hear you in? so it could, it could be my airpod so i'm just gonna leave it in the other ear because that's why I ha that's why i wear one at a time just in case oh, so in case the battery dies but that's good sorry i didn't want to interrupt the flow no all so, good okay so yeah so the shirts are great um, also, the way that uh, you handle COVID. <laughs> oh my gosh. Just spot on, just perfect. <laughs> I just, really, you guys, you guys did so many great little touches that add up oh. to such a good film. Yeah, it's uh, interesting. Nina. Thank you. It's interesting because we've now, like, yeah, we made it in 2020 and we've been doing the festival circuit. Uh, thing uh, for nine months. Uh, so it's played sort of all over America, Hawaii, it's played in London and other countries. And it's really interesting when the audience comes up to you after they've seen the movie and initially they were maybe a little apprehensive to watch anything to do with COVID, which I completely understand. Um, but there weirdly seems to be after watching the movie a catharsis that I can laugh at some of this ridiculousness. And there's like a sense of release maybe when the movie is working of just being like, oh my god remember we all went through and how stupid it now looks and feels and especially in those early days when the characters are trying to figure out what to do with their day and like, um it's just all it's such an interesting thing because because of that we've all had a universal experience that we can almost all relate to which is so yeah. rare yeah. um yeah yeah and same like i do not want to think about it talk about it much like it always comes up anyway so i yeah. would think like oh i don't want to you know even think go back to that place but it's not a bad thing it's a good thing so done well yeah i think it's interesting because ration my partner talks about this all the time and ultimately the goal of art is to reflect our lives and we can only ignore so much that this is now yeah. in all of our lives literally we can't ignore it so i think it just depends if the story warrants it like and if it can add something to it to include it or not include it and in this case like what to us really the movie is about is not COVID but sort of to us what we examine as like our life priorities and how that changed in so many ways for many people during COVID because life just stopped and so we often describe as like both these characters Geraldine's character and mine had a very clear idea at the beginning of the movie the kind of person they want to end up with the kind of life they want to have and they never considered any other possibility. And then um, they would have, you know, if there was no COVID, just gone on this date and then never ever spoken again. And then because they were forced to be with each other, suddenly they were changing all those priorities and re-examining them 
um, for each other. And that's a lot of, I think, what happened to a lot of people I know during this time too, which is that they suddenly stopped life and they were like, do I like my job? Do I like my partner? Right. Do I like my circumstances? And for me and Roshan, like, you know, we had written other things and, and they were not happening. And then when this happened, we were like, should we just make our own thing instead of waiting for people to be like, can the permission to make it? And that's really, this movie would not exist if it wasn't for COVID. We would have just like marched on with like our regular yeah. lives. So in so many ways, I think like the story sort of, it works in the world of the story. Okay, I'm, I'm, you're breaking up still and I don't want to lose oh, what you're no. saying. Yeah. So I think what I made, I just have to make sure this is good. If you don't mind, I'm switching my no. speaker please, so please, that please. I can hear it from my computer so that I know okay, if great. it's me or if it's the input. So give me one great. second, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, okay, speaker, so I'm gonna go to, all right, can you talk again for me? Yes, talking now, speaking now. Can you hear me? One, two, three, four, five, six. This is better. I, I'm glad because that means everything <laughs> you just said was good to go. So, oh, all right, good. so let's just keep going like this and, and I won't Great. use my AirPods. So, um, okay, so the Duplass brothers, you got them involved somehow or just Mark or what's the, yeah. what's the deal there? Yeah, the, yeah, mainly Mark. So basically I the second ever movie I did was this movie called Safety Not Guaranteed. And um, Mark acted in that and produced it. And this was over a decade ago in 2011, we filmed it. And so I was still a college student. I left my graduation to go film this movie. Uh, I didn't end up walking that year, that summer. And I was uh, very nervous about getting out into the real world and about the career path that I had chosen. And Mark sort of zeroed in on my nervous 22 year old energy and was like, it's gonna be hard, but like, here's my number and like, call me if you ever need anything, whatever. And he sort of became a mentor figure uh, mm. to me. And then we'd socially been like hanging out and like would see each other over the years. And then we re-teamed on the show Room 104, which they created for HBO and that I acted in and later directed an episode of. And we were looking to do another movie or something together. And then when uh, COVID happened, we sort of, the first person we sent it to was him because they are so known for kind of making stuff with crazy constraints of budget and time and all of this stuff. And it also totally felt really right for the kind of movies they make, which is again, the way you describe the characters are very real. It's very funny, very emotional, and it's simple, but like makes you feel a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> like there's no car chases, there's none of that stuff, but like you leave and the scenes stay with you and it's sort of about human beings the kind of movies that don't get made as often nowadays so um they read it very quickly and sort of jumped on board and after that we were like off to the races well it was amazing. yeah that's great uh, that's so nice that he said that to you when yeah, you were he's, yeah he's incredible he i feel him and his brother do not get enough uh <laughs> enough uh, shine on what they're doing which is they're constantly empowering people uh who have not been given an opportunity people of color women uh, to do huge things like uh, make movies and create things. And on their showroom 104, almost every director was a person of color or a woman who had never gone to direct before. And it was an HBO show. So right away, it gave them a huge credit so they could use that to do other stuff. And their theory about it, from what I understand, is very simple, which is that often in life, you are in the sidelines waiting to get the opportunity to do the thing that you really want to do. And if you give someone the chance to do that and support them with like a group of people that will help them when, with things they don't know, they will end up working 10 times as hard as the person who's had that opportunity 100 times because they've sort of just gone on autopilot maybe a little bit. And so what ends up happening is you get people who will work so hard and create something because they might never have the opportunity to again. And so it ends up creating like really interesting art and um, creating a really fun like working environment. So for me and Roshan, like in this movie, we're like, we're getting to make a movie. Like, so we were just so thrilled and we put like our 200% into it. And it was a crazy shoot. And we shot the movie in eight days, which is like unheard of. And, but every day felt like I cannot believe someone gave us the chance to do this. And so it just led to everyone working at like their best level and, um, it's sort of like their business philosophy and they have the power um, to do that. They have the power to give people these opportunities and they continue to do that with every single thing they make, which is, I think, so amazing. And so many times in positions of power in Hollywood, there's so much fear with trying something new or giving someone new a chance, um, but they sort of never 
like stop with that they're always always doing it and i just think it's just such a great example of what can come from like doing that because everything they make is so interesting and unique yeah i agree i mean a lot of, i feel like i've seen a lot from them more and more <laughs> lately which yeah and they're also different but you're right they have those ingredients or those qualities mm -hmm that are, you almost can't put your finger on what it is, but there's yeah. like some humanity in there for sure. Exactly. I and it's like helping, it's great to hear that I didn't know all about that with the opportunities they're giving everybody who really needs those opportunities. That's, and that's what creates the interesting things. So it yeah. works for everybody. It works for everyone because on their end, you know, they get all these interesting projects and interesting stories. And Mark has described it in many ways, like his twenties and thirties, he made a lot of things that he directed, he acted and he wrote. And he had all these stories inside of him that he he says he's gotten to express in many ways. And he hit this like stage at the end of his 30s where he was like, I think I've expressed it all and I've been given every opportunity. And now he really enjoys producing, which is what are your ideas? What are your things? And how can I help bring that to light? And oh, what are the God. other stories I can tell? And he's really good at it. And he's really sort of identified like what works. And it was really interesting, you know, when they were giving notes on the script before we started, which is a very normal thing they never it was like my fear from other years of hollywood development that they would be like this movie's too indian and like you need to make it more relatable here and explain this there and explain that here they never did that they were like write this the way like you would want to watch it and it would be authentic to you watching it and then everyone else they were like we'll get it or we'll get some version of that like they'll be able to relate to it in some version the more specific the story is and which i thought was so smart and really empowering to us too because we were like okay we don't have to for lack of a better word, whitewash the script to make it seem like more accessible. Actually, the more specific it is, the more people will relate to it in their own way. Um, yeah. And so that was really interesting too. Yeah, that's one of those tricks, right? With writing and everything else is actually mm -hmm. the more specific you go and the less general, the more relatable it is, which you think it's counterintuitive, but it yeah. like, is one of those things. Yeah, because everyone can, yeah, picks up on some version of that thing yeah. to their experience, so yeah. So you are feel to me like you really understand Hollywood, like you really have been <laughs> in it. It's true. I just want to say, like, I didn't know this until we started talking, yeah. but you really feel like you've got the inside look on what it's all about, the entertainment industry. Like, and you're, you know, you're young and yeah. you really seem like you know what's up. Well, yes, I'm a big Hollywood nerd. So Wait, there's more. Check out part one of this talk where Karin dishes on finally getting an agent. Well, sort of. What happened after that and an emotional struggle he's going through right now. There's a link to that video in the description below. If you liked this video, please smash that like button and remember to subscribe and tap the notifications bell for more real talks with your favorite actors and celebrities. And please drop a comment. I read them and I'm interested. I'd like to know what you're thinking. I'm Kara. Thanks for hanging out with me and Karin and I'll see you in the next video.